Talk All about right. talk about stress, Cody. We just follow stress, and then we get this. Yeah, no up kidding. Here in front of everybody. Well, right now, my, you can hear my heart beating on the micro. <laughs> <laughs> so he told me a joke beforehand. He told me he asked how many people he I've ever spoke in front of, and I told him, and he said he spoke in front of two billion, Jeff and Bill, billion. <laughs> so, anyways. Uh, we're going to touch a little bit about 60 inch corn. First off, I want to see from the crowd, how many of you guys have tried 60 inch corn on your own operations? Okay, how many you plan on trying in the next year or two? All right. Uh, anybody tried 44 inch corn? There's one. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to touch on that. Um, talk a, a little bit about this. We, first off, I want to give the credit to Bob Recker. Uh, he kind of was the one that started on 60 inch corn and, and really it's just alternative row corn. Uh, we, we, he was looking at it for uh, trying to find a way to increase yield. It was not started as a way to uh, plant cover crops or to get cover crops incorporated into uh, the operation. It was just strictly a way to increase yield. Uh, he kind of stumbled across the cover crop deal and, and has found out that the cover crop actually makes it work tremendously better. Uh, it really helps with weed suppression. So uh, a couple years ago there was an article in the Furrow magazine talking about that. I had one of my clients call and ask if I thought it would work and, and I'm never one to say that something won't work until I see it not work several times. So I said let's give it a try. So we started there and, and this last year uh, I was working with just about 600 acres of 60 inch corn. Uh, and I was working on farms in South Dakota, Minnesota, and Iowa, and Wisconsin. So, and Dave's was one of those. Um, so we've, we've, that's kind of the, the history behind it. Uh, I looked at it, I'd been working with farms uh, where we were doing a lot of early interseeding. We were interseeding between V4 and V7 on a lot of 30 and 22 inch rows. And I looked at it as an opportunity to get all of our cover crops seeded at once. What we were doing is we were getting a lot of diversity in the early seeding, but we were having to come back to get rye planted later because that wasn't working underneath the corn canopy. I looked at 60 inch corn as an opportunity to get everything seeded at once and then we could be ready for soybean planting the following year. So this is just a field, uh, this is David's field here uh, of the 60 inch corn that, that uh, this picture would have been taken uh, when was your field day? Uh, July 31st. In July 31st. So just to show you what kind of what it looks like uh, this, I'm going to let David talk a little bit about this here. Yeah. Uh, this is him planting. Yeah, this is just what I used to plant it. I just shut every other row off uh, and then we doubled the population. We tricked the planter. So we shut every other row off. We set the planter at 60,000 plants per acre. So we are, have a 30,000 plant per acre stand. So as we look at that, uh, some of the keys to making this work uh, is first off seed emergence. Uh, it's, plant emergence is always crucial whether you're on 60, 30, um, anything, but it's really, really important to have it all come up at the same time when, when we're in 60 inch corn because you've got your corn plants so close together. Uh, then we get into seed placement. Uh, it's probably, there again, it's ever more crucial to have proper seed placement with that. Uh, you want to make sure planting conditions are almost as perfect as possible because we saw, as we saw this year, uh, we think there were some issues with that. We're going to touch on that a little bit. Uh, we're going to show you some, how, some, some things how no-till versus till can work. Uh, population, David touched on that a little bit, but I think it's really crucial uh, to make this work on your operation is to, to make sure you keep the per acre population the same. Uh, you have to remember to double your, your per row population to shut off every other row. Um, so there's been people that try to, to try to do that with just shutting every other row off and it's that's when we have the disasters. Um, nutrient application is going to be crucial and then hybrid selection. So we're going to touch on all those. So here's another, oh here we go. This is uh, this is my field after we planted it. Uh, I don't need, know if I need to say too much other than I no-tilled it into wheat stubble. We put a, a dry starter, 250 pounds of 27, 18, 9, uh, 2 by 2 and then uh, there might be later on, but I'll tell you now, we put uh, side dress 28%, 35 gallons. There, there it is, yeah, I set, and I shut every other row off, so uh, the dry fertilizer, we actually didn't, 
shut the row off for fertilizer in between the rows, so that got some in the middle. But uh, when we side dressed, we side dressed all 25 gallons right beside the row, or 35 gallons right beside the row. This is another one of my field as it was coming up. You can just see the cover crops just coming up. It was already seeded in there. We seeded the cover crops at V5, five leaf, so the corn was about three, four inches tall. And this was just another picture uh, a couple weeks later of the cover crop starting to grow. What did you seed the cover crop with? We seeded it with a 10 foot hay buster drill. Uh, great, the old hay buster drill, we, we tied two rows up where the rows were and just went out there and drove back and forth. I've actually got a, a video of it in my pocket that we didn't get on the slides, but yeah, we just when they were 10 foot drill, tied two rows up and went and planted around it. It's kind of like the old days of cultivating, you had to watch really close and I hit, <laughs> I hit the row at times because I only had, you know, about that much, well, it was a, I didn't have a lot of room. We hit the row once in a while, but it didn't seem to affect the corn at all. I mean, it hurt it, but it came right back out of it. So I almost think you could go with a planter in any old direction. That, that's a good point. I, I've been working on interseeding for several years now and, and we've, as we've learned and tried different things, I'm not so sure just taking an old, just taking a drill out and just planting it. You're gonna, especially if you're at V2, V3, you're definitely gonna push some corn down, but it's, how many times have we seen it hailed off at that time and it comes right back? Yep. Um, I think we're making this interceding way too difficult. Yep. So we're gonna show you some different ideas and different things that you can do. Um, but I do think a drill over broadcast and a drill of any kind over broadcast is going to be way better. Absolutely. So here's just another picture of what it looks like. And this is just showing the value of that cover crop. Imagine that 60 inch gap in between the rows without a cover crop. Uh, you're going to get substantial more growth here. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the mixes and how to develop some of those mixes and things you got to look at. But um, this is really going to help with some weed suppression. So this is a picture that, that we have in central Minnesota. This is for some 44 inch corn uh, taken late summer too. Just wanted to show you some of the diversity that we have growing through there, but also look how clean the field is in terms of weeds. But, but one thing I really like to show in this picture is look at the plant health. And we see this on every, every one of the fields. We see tremendous plant health all the way down to the bottom of the plant. And, and we get asked the question a lot, why is that? Uh, we don't see a lot of fungus issues. We just don't see a lot of a lot of stress on this corn But you think we're widening it out. We're getting more air movement through there We're getting sunlight down to the bottom leaves and and the everything is just healthier with that added sunlight So this is just showing another uh, another picture here of, of the field day uh, What kind of I, I like that picture because it can show just how tall and thick that corn actually looks but this was uh, the ears that were taken off. This was the 60 inch corn and this was the 30 inch corn. So I will tell you when we saw this, I was really getting excited. Uh, we thought we were really going to see some tremendous yield impacts off of that. Um, but anyways, it, it just seemed like it was, it, everything was a little faster. It was a little quicker. Uh, so we were, things were looking pretty good. Uh, this is another one later. Uh, even this would have been in August. Yeah. That's so, just a picture that we were, we went. We we're going to try to ride horse down it, but the horses didn't like it because the 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 cover crops got up to uh, five feet tall, right up to my chin, and uh, tremendous growth. Yeah. Uh, did you use any uh, free herbicides or Roundup? We used yeah. uh, Roundup 2,4-D and Verdict. We we applied that pre emergence and we did come back the day before we planted the cover crop with straight roundup I don't really know if we would have needed to but there was a spear grass here and there so we thought roundups cheap let's just burn it off but uh, this was no tilled in the wheat stubble and I guess the one thing I would say is if you haven't no tilled and haven't had wheat in the rotation the benefit of that with weeds is tremendous and that's a big 
reason for some of the success of this, I think, too. I mean, it, this was a very, I, I can tell you there was a few weeds. You know, there was a little bit of water hemp, but it was very, very little, and the millet overtook the water hemp. The millet grew faster than the water hemp, and, uh, you know, between me and Cody, you might have found two water hemp. And where we saw the water hemp is where we side dressed. Where that coulter ran, or we side dressed the 35 gallons, the 28, that's where most of the water hemp were, where we, where we disturbed the ground. So when we were talking about stress, or the last speaker was talking about stress, at this point in time, I was starting to get pretty stressed out about this cover crop, because I was thinking this was pretty big, and I was just starting to worry that we were gonna have some harvest issues. Um, that ended up not being an issue at all. After we hit a frost, the millet really fell down. Actually, everything really fell down and, and we didn't have experience any issues with harvestability. So just how much biomass did we get? Uh, on this plot here, uh, there was 23,000 pounds of biomass equivalent to 6,500 pounds of dry matter. So if we want to compare that, in this plot, we weren't comparing 60-inch cover crops versus 30-inch cover crops. We were trying to compare 60-inch with the cover crop versus 30 with none because we wanted to compare it against something that's a little more mainstream and what's actually happening out there. Uh, so this is another one uh, down in Iowa, 30 versus 60, both of them being interseeded. We saw 3,300 pounds per acre versus 320 on the 30-inch rows. So we've had tremendously better luck with the 30-inch than that, but that in that particular plot, that's what we were seeing. So it's all gonna depend on what we have seeded in that cover crop and how, for how much biomass we're gonna get. So this is just another late season. Um, you can see that millet starting to fall over here. Yeah, when that, when that millet, yeah, when that millet put its head on, it was so tall, and, and I mean, it doesn't normally grow five feet tall. When I put the head on, it basically tipped over and it took all the buckwheat. There was a lot of buckwheat that got the same height. Both of them just tipped over flat, uh, even before it froze. But then the next picture shows where it's, with it froze. I so mean, the, this picture is almost the combine that everything was was no more than a foot off the ground. Yeah. So this picture is a little deceiving in here. There's still a lot of biomass down there. It's just laying flat to the ground. Um, but. As a cow guy, I couldn't imagine getting a fence out there. I mean, I just wanted to get, get a fence around that thing. And this is just another picture of what it looked like at, at harvest time. Uh, this was the day of harvest. And that's what it looked like after the fact. So this is what we seeded in this particular mix. And I'm not going to say that this is the right answer. Uh, this is just... I think we're going to tweak it for next year, but, but she, we've got some red clover, buckwheat, uh, some cow peas, millet, hairy vetch, uh, we had some oats, rape, sun hemp, flax, annual ryegrass, and you can see the cost was $18. So the, the amount of, of uh, millet I believe was a little high. I'd like to drop that down or, or maybe even take it out. It does depend completely on what your goal is, what you're trying to accomplish. If you're trying to graze something, it's gonna look completely different. If you wanted to go back to, uh, the, well, I'll go back to the biomass samples. If we had uh, 6,000 pounds of dry matter, or three ton, there's a little more than that, uh, what's the value of that for hay? You know, what are you gonna pay for your hay right now? It's gonna I'm sure you know be over a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars a ton. Uh, so you could say you take half and graze half. You're you're making up for some if you're missing anything for yield there. Uh, there's some other things. I think the cow peas did really well, but they ended up get, kind of getting shaded out. I think the cow peas would work really good at a higher rate. Um, I think uh, some even some more sun hemp, but I think in this situation more. Uh, warm season legumes would, would make a lot of sense in this situation. Hey, we only had five pounds of millet in there, but the millet and buckwheat just took over everything. And you know the other thing on that, this mix, is we could do the exact same mix next year and it could look completely different. So, oh, okay, so just looking at some different um, ways that, some different interseeding tools that, that we've been working with. Uh, this is actually a 22-inch interseeder that was built over in Minnesota. 
and this is what it looks like after the fact. Uh, so we can get you know some pretty good stands with some of these. Uh, this is just another one. This is what I was talking about, although I think I'd do it at, a, at an earlier stage. Uh, here's another uh, inner seeder that was built with the Lilliston cultivator. So I, I just want you to think outside the box a little bit. Use what maybe use what you have laying around. Find something uh, if you can find a drill. Well, there's, there's a lot of drills around. I mean, and I don't necessarily know that it's got to be a no-till drill. Uh, I think you could even take you know a, an old press drill or something like that and just use it as a seed distributor and get out there and, and get your cover crop established. Uh, this is another one up in north central Minnesota. Uh, this just the gandy box put on here. This is what that looks like. That was when they were on 30 inches. Uh, so 30, 60, 30. There's been a lot of talk about that. Uh, this, this is one field that we did last year. It did work pretty well for yield wise. Uh, the strips, we, we noticed the strips going into the next year. So we had the same cover crop seeded all the way through obviously. But what sur we had way more survive the winter and the, and the spring because, or the summer because of that extra sunlight. When you put all that seed into those two rows, we even created more of a canopy in there and, and saw very little growth through there. So uh, that was one, one of the main issues. And then coming into this year, you can see some weed pressure coming in those middle rows where you didn't have it in the wide rows. Uh, so trying to figure out what cover crop mixes to do and then nutrient application becomes really difficult in this versus just skipping every other row. Uh, this is just another picture of that 44 inch corn. Um, so I want to talk, we talked about the uh, maintaining population. I, if I can hammer one thing in when we come into wide row corn or skip row corn or 60 inch row or 44 or maybe 40, the big reason behind it whatever it is, is, is we just, we don't want to change equipment. We want to use whatever you're using and just skip the row. But it's very important to remember we have to maintain that population. And I, if, if you can remember anything, just maintain the per acre population. Uh, we need to seed that cover crop early. Uh, we, it really helps if we can get nutrients in row and, and somehow, somehow anyway, get them placed in row, especially your nitrogen. And then, uh, yeah, this was just the straight 44. So when you're designing that cover crop blend, what are you, you have to look at what your goal is. So in this situation on David's plot, uh, grazing was not an option. That was not what our goal was, uh, but we probably had the best cover crop set up for grazing, you know? So we, we know that now and, and can make some changes and make some tweaks. But we did have really good weed control from that blend. So if that's an issue, uh, you're going to have a different cover crop blend than if you're not so worried about weeds. We had another plot where it was all cool seasons and uh, we had a little more weed escapes from that because we didn't have any warm season species taking advantage of that sunlight in between the rows. Uh, so, Do we want to fix nitrogen? I think that's something we could really be looking at, um, especially with all that space in between the row. I do think if you're doing that, you really have to be focused on your nutrient application. We know those legumes are not going to produce a lot of nitrogen when they go in uh, to a, a, a soil that's, that's got an excess of it. So if you can keep that nitrogen close to the corn, keep it kind of the, the middle of the row starved, I think you grow some legumes in there. Uh, we can have some good luck with that. Uh, do we want it to overwinter or do we want it to winter kill? I'm working with farms on, on both sides of it that want everything to overwinter or, and they want everything to winter kill. And then the biggest thing, uh, our big advantage here is, is really our opportunity for diversity. And I, I like the idea of having wheat in the rotation ahead of this, but if we can't, this is our one opportunity for a lot of you corn and soybean producers to really increase that biodiversity on your farms. So now yields, this is what everybody wants to talk about. And it's completely dependent on situation. So we've seen anywhere from a 1% increase to a 13% decrease, depending upon the situation, depending upon uh, cover crops. So if we go back, we can talk about uh, David's yields a little bit. They varied, what, were, they, what, were, what we, was the we, variation there? Our plot averaged 12% less. Uh, we saw variations from 
oh, probably I didn't figure the percentage, but almost 20% to just the exact opposite where the 60s were a little better. Um, one thing that was quite interesting is, so I had four replications, four, I had 30 inch corn, 60 inch corn, and I replicated that four times across the field. And we saw uh, a 47 bushel yield difference in the 30 inch corn from one side of the field to the other in each replication. And the 60s inch, the 60 inch corn varied five bushel an acre. So it was way more consistent. On our poorer ground, the more rolling ground, the 60 inch corn was better. And on the better ground, the higher producing ground, our, our 30 inch corn was way better. And I, I don't have any answers for that. We don't have any answers why that was, but plant health, as Cody's been saying, so when we got on the rolling ground where we have probably more eroded hills and more uh, nutrient issues, the 60 inch corn was just all the way across. The 60 inch corn was just looked phenomenal. I took numerous, I don't know, I think we probably had close to 200 people out in the plot <laughs> over the summer. I took numerous uh, agronomists out there, didn't say a word, just walk out there with them and they all just say, this can't work, this just makes no sense. And they'd look at that 60 inch corn and it was darker green, green top to bottom, no uh, deficiencies. 30 inch corn had deficiencies, it was yellow, it wasn't as healthy, but in the end it still didn't yield as good. But uh, plant health, standability, when we combined it, the 60s stood perfect. The 30s were still standing pretty good too, but there definitely was a little more stock. The 60 inch corn stalks were as strong or stronger than the 30 inch corn. Yeah, we actually had a field in southern Minnesota two year, or last year uh, where the whole field was laying flat except for the 60s. The 60s were standing straight up. Yeah. So standability on that is, is amazing. It's and I think that goes back to plant. Just the opposite of what you'd think. Yep. Yeah. We, that was my biggest fear with wide row corn was it was all going to fall over flat because you're talking putting that corn two three, three inches three inches apart yeah about three inches apart so um, anyways we've done a lot of this stuff in, in high yield environments done a few of them in low but but this does also work in a high yield environment so that's not something to be scared of uh, you want to make sure you, it's just like everything else that we're doing you got to have a plan and you want to follow through with that plan uh, make sure you've got the proper planting equipment. Variable rate is huge. Uh, it, it does not work very well to take an old planter and try and reset up the sprockets and, and make that work to get just as much, as, as high a population as you can. Uh, if, if, it, in, any, if you can, you know, if you got V-Drive, uh, downforce is huge too because that's play, helping as, as was talked on earlier. Um, just getting that that seed placement is so crucial on that. And then I really think no-till works the best in this, and this is probably gonna show why. Uh, this is gonna show the value of, of what tillage has, has the ability to do. So this was 30 inch strip till and with 60 inch corn. And that's just showing, this, is, this wasn't anything that was seeded, that was, that's just your weeds coming up. So this is the value in, in doing this in a no-till situation. Um, you kind of suppress those weeds early, get a cover crop there, and then come back. So um, things to consider, uh, a lot of this stuff, uh, we've already kind of touched on some of this, but hybrid selection being one of them. Uh, we were having a conversation earlier, this, uh, earlier today. Hybrid selection is huge and it's got to be at least a moderate to a high flex. Uh, that, is, that is very, very crucial with that. Um, a lot of places are going to think it should be the opposite because you're getting those plants so close together. Remember, it's flexing outward, and and you're really, you really you do have a lot of room to to touch on it. You got anything? Yeah, there? I'll make a comment. So he keeps bringing up even emergence and seed placement, and what we saw in my plot, and I I think what part of our issue was with our yield decrease was uh, we planted this year uh, May fourth is when we planted the plot and everybody else that was about the first day planters rolled and then we had some bad weather right after that and most everybody had to replant what they planted on those days i was fortunate this came up and i didn't but it took it was over a week period of time that that corn was coming up and i think that part of my yield difference was the uneven emergence and i think it's magnified in 60 inch corn because your plants are so close together I think your seed spacing and your, and I don't have proof of this, it's just my thoughts. 
I think the even emergence and seed placement is even more critical on 60 compared to 30. You know, they say 30 if you have a one inch deviation is a seven bushel loss. Well, when you got the plants three inches apart and you got a, an inch deviation there, what's the yield loss? I can't tell you that, but I, from what I saw, I think that that uneven emergence that we had was magnified in the 60 inch corn. Both the 30s and the 60s came up terrible. I mean, we were looking at it, we're going to have to replant this, we're going to have to replant this. But it was magnified in the 60 inch corn, it was worse, I think. And I think it's just because they're so close together. You know, some of that you can't control. But that's my thought on it, anyway. Okay, so now I'm going to touch on the possibility of grazing corn. Has anybody grazed corn? Okay. So this was actually done up in northern Minnesota. This was on 44 inch corn. Uh, I can tell you the soybeans were planted in between the rows that did not work very well um, in that situation. And then they planted ryegrass and they didn't have very good luck with the ryegrass growing. Uh, but as you can tell, they, got, they just had 21 acres, uh, grazed it for 40 days and with 160 head, uh, equaling out to 6,400 cow days or 305 days an acre. So if you look at, uh, I, think it, I think South Dakota State's saying anywhere from 225 to $3 a day to winter cows this winter. Um, just say you use it at, at $2 a day, you're talking $610 gross per acre. Uh, and that is with a, no soybeans and a poor, a very, basically non-existent cover crop. So, if you wanted to take a, and get a successful cover crop, maybe you get some hairy vetch, it's going to hold its protein late into the winter. Uh, you're, you're going to have a lot more diversity, you get some, get some brassicas in there as well. Uh, you could substantially increase that uh, grazing potential through the winter. So the other thing to think about is when you're grazing this corn, you don't have to worry about dry down so much. So now maybe you could take Maybe you could graze a rye crop or an overwintering crop early in the spring before you plant the corn. Maybe you could harvest something off of that. Uh, do a you know a late spring, early summer uh, rye hay type situation, and then come out. Um, or I would prefer to graze it, but uh, depending upon the situation. So there's a lot of opportunities here. You can do this and plant this later in the season because we're not trying to get it dried down for harvest. So that's. Kind of the, the last thing I really wanted to touch on, uh, this is just a little bit about us, but or about uh, Soil RX and, and what we do. But uh, is there any questions? Um, you mentioned um, fertility a little bit, not much. Are you banding all your end right alongside the corn row? I did, I did this year, yep. And then how many units of end are you banding down? That's a lot of end in one corn. We put 35 gallons right beside the row. And then with the planter, with the planter, we came with a 250 pounds of 27.18.9, so that would be uh, uh, 27 times 2 is uh, 64, no, 54, 54 pounds, but half of that went in the middle of the row because I couldn't shut the middle one off. And then we added another 35 gallons of 28%. And we did that on both the 30 and the 60. So that should end up being, in, uh, what was, I don't have that number in my head. What, 35 gallons would be? 30 gallons is 105 units of end. I had 35, so we had, 100 and, we had about 160 units of end out there. Okay. And my answer would be yes and no. I mean, we've done it every which way, where we're trying to band everything as close as possible. We've done stuff with broadcast. I can tell you specifically that corn does not like to reach out 30 inches. So broadcast is going to most likely be a failure. Uh, so anyway, and this is where, you know, multiple applications is going to be good, you know, so you're not getting it all down at once. Can, um, can we get by with less fertilizer on 60 inch corn? I mean, my 60 inch corn was green top to bottom all year, never showed a bit of, nutri of nitrogen deficiency. The 30 inch corn, you could see when you get down below the ear, you could see all the way across that 30 inch, 120 feet wide. It, 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 the leaves were just about gone up to the ear from nutrient from nitrogen deficiency, and uh, but the yield still showed the other way. We were growing more corn over there, I guess. But uh, so could, could we get by with less nitrogen on the 60-inch corn because of the cover crops growing and the the more air movement? Uh, I'd want 
one person tell me, you know, the more air movement in the 60 inch corn made it evaporate more water, so that means it took in more water in the bottom. What took in more, more water, it took more nutrients in. All theories, we don't know. <laughs> What herbicides have you done besides what? Uh, we've tried, I haven't had any huge failures on, on any of the herbicides. Um, we did, um, I, I can get you some of that stuff. We'll, we'll have some of that information, yep. There's not a lot of herbicides out there that you can put with the, with the blend that we had that it's not gonna take out something. Yep, yep. Uh, but. For me, I, I, I'm gonna try it again next year and I think we're gonna leave the verdict out. Yeah. Because I don't think we needed it in there. I think that, I mean, I had a whole 120 acre field that we sprayed the verdict and Roundup 2,4-D on the 60 inch corn and the 30 inch corn, the, the plot. But the rest of the field we didn't, you know, we sprayed our Roundup 2,4-D and that, there weren't many weeds that come in. The verdict, the verdict didn't hold out many weeds there was the same weeds in the other field, you know. I don't think it did a whole lot for us. Will you go back to corn or will you go to soybeans? Well, <laughs> we'll let the Soil Health Coalition, I worked with the Soil Health Coalition. I think they kind of want to see me go back to, to, to beans and then they want to compare that strip and see what we get a, if we get an increase in bean yield. But I'm really tempted to go out there and put one strip of corn, move over 30 inches and put one strip of corn in one strip there and just see what we can do if that'll work. I, it, it's interesting that you ask that because I think that's probably the biggest uh, question that gets asked after this is can we can we just move over 30 inches every year and go back and forth. Grow corn with a lot of diversity in between. Um, we're gonna we're definitely gonna be trying some of that so uh, we'll be in year one of some of those trials next year. Have you guys ever done uh, 60 inch twin roll? No but I love the idea. Uh, I think, I, I, I know some people that are going to try it this year, going to attempt it. Um, I think it's a great idea. Question over there. Um, could you go back and you talked about flex here and, and semi-flex here. What about, like what was your maturity or corn? Did it mature quicker? Was it dried down? <laughs> yeah, that, that's the comment I was going to make. So. On the field day when, when we would go out to the field on July 30th or 29th, whenever it was, the 60 inch corn was a longer ear and the 30 inch was a lot shorter. I mean, we saw that and wow, this stuff's a week ahead. When we come through and took the plot out, we had, it was a 98 day corn, all the same corn all the way across. The 30 inch corn was 1% drier and one pound heavier test weight. And that was consistent over every replication. And the absolute opposite of what we were absolute thinking. Absolute opposite of what we were thinking. Don't ask me why. <laughs> we, there was a time this summer we were thinking maybe we'd be able to extend our maturity on this corn, on the 60 inch corn. Use a longer maturity corn to maybe give us a, an opportunity to maybe increase yield. The one pound less test weight in the 60 inch corn, I'm afraid just by talking with seed uh, agronomists, that's kind of a characteristic of planting too heavy, too thick, too close together. And I mean, right there, that's a five bushel decrease on my, we had, the corn was 192 and 174. I mean, that's almost a five bushel decrease right there in yield, just that one pound <laughs> test weight. And I don't know if we can overcome that one. Maybe we can, but from a seed agronomist, they seem to think that that's a result of, if you want to increase your test weight, you got to lower your population. Have you had anybody try lower population? We have. Um, we've tried 75 percent, 85 percent. 85, I th actually think 85 percent of total per acre population might actually be really close to increasing the net dollars a little bit. But we still, I've only had it on one field and it's, I don't have strong enough data to show anything on that for but sure. Bob Recker, his data shows, who's been doing it for a lot of years, shows Ab of how, many, how many plots did he have that only one or two plots were better at a lower population. Almost everyone was better at a higher population. Yep, yep. Yeah, and, and he was doing a lot of 75%, 100%, and up to 125%. Yep. Yep. And his, his conclusion was stay the same population of what you're planting. He said, yep. don't go less. Yep. That was, 
he actually said use the same population and the same hybrids. Yep. Yeah, don't so, switch to another. Yep. He but says, I, I will say, and, and I think he'd agree that definitely a flex or yep. semi flex hybrid. Yeah. Hey, Cody, I, I'm going to have the opportunity with some small plot research in, in North Dakota, just North Britain. Mm -hmm. And uh, just wonder what you would have for suggestions that you think would, would be good in small plots. And we have the capability to do the pair of grow with this single row planter. I can move the row over, you know, three or four inches, just go up and back. Um, we can't match, you know, precisely to get a perfect zigzag pattern, but um, that's something I think maybe I could do in a small plot. Any other ideas? Well, I, I think, I mean, to me, the we got to look at what we can do as an industry. You know, what what's going to be a viable change without getting farms to have to go spend a bunch of money to do something completely different. That's really why I like the 60 inch. I also think that we could make twin row work very well. That was talked about, but if we, I mean, I, you also got to look at farmers comfort levels and what are they going to be the most comfortable with? I can tell you that 60 inch corn scares the ever living daylights out of 90% of the farmers, maybe 95%. Um, obviously the ones in here are a little more open to it, but I think if we were going to sell it to them as a, a 60 inch twin, it would be a completely different ball game. So that to me is the, that's the area I would be looking at. Um, I can tell you on my 44 inch data versus the 60, there's very little risk in 44 inch corn and the 60 if you have cows there's very little risk because it's not a big enough yield impact throughout all the plots that I have um, if you don't have cows I would if you don't have cows I'd start small and if you have cows I'm I'm to the point where I'd say let's go all in you know uh, on the 60 inch corn because you're gonna be able even if you have a failure you're gonna be able to capitalize on it um, but I think the twin row 60s makes a lot of sense. I'll keep thinking on that too and I'll let you know yeah, if I come up with something. But when you, when you say to go all in on it, so for me to go in, all, all in on this, I'm kind of against that because I go back to the seed spacing and, and, and emergence and all that stuff. I planted this field at two and a half miles an hour and that's slow. I usually go 4.2 and when I went from two and a half back to 4.2 I thought I was driving a race car. And you know what? Can you tell how your planter's set up? Yeah, I got. I have a John Deere. I have the. I have the popcorn John Deere's version of the, you know, the popcorn seed disc, which probably isn't as good as a precision plant, but it does a pretty good job if I keep my speed down. You know, I can keep it up in the 98, 99 percent uh, range as far as of spacing. And my spacing on my on my 60 inch corn was pretty good too. I mean, it they were pretty accurate. But I think when what we saw here of the importance of it being more accurate in the 60 inch corn, I don't think you can go plant 60 inch corn at five miles an hour and, and you might take a big hit. <laughs> you know, so I guess no matter what, I'd say you kind of start small and, and, uh, and learn. Because it, does, it does depend on what you have for equipment, for sure. Yep. If you had the high speed Planter, with, you know, where you can drive 10 miles an hour, maybe you can run five. I don't know. Is a question back there? You got any concern with that real life buckwheat going to seed? Uh, it's going to grow, and, and I'm not. I'm actually fine with that. Hopefully, I can get my beans planted earlier, and the buckwheat is easy to kill. Round. This isn't wild buckwheat. This is tame buckwheat. So just a sniff around yeah. up, it'll kill it. And even if we get a little bit coming back in the in the beans, I don't think it's going to hurt us. Yeah, I'm not I'm not concerned about. The, so the question the question was: Is there any concern about the millets or the buckwheat coming back the following year? So the very little concern. The the buckwheat did put a lot of seed on. There will be buckwheat. The millet, I don't think there's viable seed out there. I might be wrong. We'll find out. But uh, I guess I'm not worried about it. Yeah, the Absolutely. hairy vetch is going to be yep. the, the hairy vetch yep. should be there. Red clover. Yep. Yep. Red clover and your our, uh, cereal rye if it made it. Yep. We're not sure the cereal rye survived. Yeah, cereal rye and annual rye at that point in time are awfully tough to tell 
what's what and what's going to make it through. So and it, it got shaded out pretty bad. What's your actual cost per day on corn grazing? Do you know? Um. Uh, no, I don't. I, so on that situation, you'd have to go back and look at what the cost. So the yeah, go ahead and you want to do that. What's your actual cost per day on that corn? Yeah, so you got in that situation, and I'll go back to that slide. Um, there, you got to look at what your costs are. So I mean, you can't really put that. You got to look at that in perspective of what your, you know, what your land cost is, what your seed cost is. I can tell you in this situation, it was really interesting. What they did was uh, because it was late season, they went around and got all the plot seed from all the neighboring seed dealers and just used that. Um, so that seed cost is going to be completely different if you went and bought I mean if you're going to pay $300 seed corn or if you're going to buy $100 seed corn or or find some stuff maybe try some bin run or, or you know there's there's some things that I think could work very very well um, and I know there's some people having some very good luck with bin run corn in this situation so uh, that is going to it's, there's going to be a lot of variation there, but if you looked at that, um, you know, I would compare it to what, what if you were going to harvest it and sell it, use that as a baseline. So, if you were, if you got four dollar corn and two hundred bushel corn, you got eight hundred dollars, you know, versus your six hundred and ten dollars before. But what did it cost you to, you know, what was the dry down, hauling, harvest, everything else? Not many people had 200 bushel of corn and sold it for $4 this year, you know? So um, I'm not sure that's a realistic number either, but. Cody, yeah. Did the cows manager balance their ration between the grain and the stover? Or was there some type of managed grazing? That, that was down the road? wire moved every three days. So they cleaned it up they, and then they Absolutely. Yep. And and what they did, what they noticed is I was worried about the waste when you because they drove it down on the side by side and the cows went there first, pulled that up before it ever got packed into the snow, and they, they grazed that off and then went back to the standing plants, standing corn first. Yep. So, yeah, what's your other question? And then the other one is, if your sole purpose is grazing, um, would you cut back your corn population for ration purposes? And is there an issue with that? Okay, so first, the first question, there's been talk about direction, and I've heard people say both ways. I've had success and failures in both. And, and I don't know that there's ever, it's really hard to do a true test on direction because you'd really have to mess up a field to, to do that test. I can tell you that we've had enough success both ways that I don't believe there's a huge difference. There may be a little bit of an advantage. I can tell you when you just go to 60 inch, that advantage is gone. You know, if you're looking at east-west versus north-south. Um, in terms of just looking, focusing on, on grazing, when you ask that question, do you mean grazing the standing corn or grazing the cover crop after you harvested the corn? Standing corn with the ration. Oh, yeah, so there again, you, you kind of got to look at what, what's your goal and, and what are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to feed stock cows and winter them through? Do you still have calves on the side? Uh, are you trying to get some rapid weight gain on those cows? I think that's all going to be part of the, the decision and, and how you're going to do that. I think there would absolutely be a benefit to back that corn population down and increase diversity on some others. What I can tell you is we've been trying to graze through the winter uh, in, in west central Minnesota for several years. And my issue had been before going to corn was everything falls flat. And nothing's been bred to, to have the standability that corn has. And, and that's the big advantage of it. But that doesn't mean I think it's got to be all corn. I think you could use corn 
And as long as you get that corn seeded a couple, like maybe two weeks in, in advance, then I think you got an opportunity to come in and maybe you can do some other warm seasons, uh, some other things that are gonna hold nutrients late into the winter. Uh, like sorghum sedan does really good for winter grazing. The problem is it falls flat. Uh, where if you just had that corn helping to hold it up, to stand, keep its standability, uh, you'd have a lot of benefit from that. So it's kind of one of those one of those answers. It depends what your goal is, but but I do think there'd be some value in that. So I, I did try that this year on some. We tried that on some prevent plant acres and. The corn was very variable where it worked and where it didn't. So uh, the question was if, if you were just solely doing it for grazing, would you, would you be able to just put bin run corn in your drill? Um, I know there's some people that have, that have done it with more success, but I, I, just, I have patches where the corn looks really good and patches where it wasn't so good. And I think the big issue there is the corn, corn doesn't handle uh, it, it doesn't handle the competition very well, but it once it's up and got a head start, and that's where I say two weeks, um, I feel like once that corn's up and ahead of it, you're off to the races. So there'd still probably be an advantage to planting it. Yeah. Yes. I have not. I have some thoughts behind it. I, I think on the, the cool seasons in, in something like that still aren't going to be quite tall enough by the time you're starting to chop. Um, now you could be talking maybe some oats or some things like that that might work in there. But I think where I would be really focused on is you could definitely increase diversity. You could do some things that are going to help to increase your protein in, in your silage but it's probably gonna be through some other warm season species. So I have done some work where we've, just on 30 inch corn, where we've seeded uh, the corn at your same population, but drilled like forage sorghum right on top of it. And, and we've seen substantial yield increases there and a little bit higher protein, not huge, but, but a little bit. But I think just the diversity is huge for that. So yeah, I, I, I think that's something else to really look at. Uh, we've not done it on the wide rows, but to me, I think where something really interesting would be to take your corn on 60s or, or wider rows and then come back through and, and drill that uh, forage blend, you know, and, and anything that might work as a forage, I think there's going to be some advantages because we see it on cow health for sure. When we add that diversity, the cows are just healthier. So I think there's a lot of value to that. Cody, don't you think that if, if, you, if you took a biomass sample of your, of your cover crop, so you put, you, I think you need to put a value to that because you're going to graze it and that's going to make this system, because you could do this and harvest it. If you're a cow guy, you might have a 9 or 10 percent protein in that cover crop, what's going to add to your grazing. So Absolutely. I think that biomass sample might be quite important. Yep. That was supposed to get done, I think, wasn't it? What was it? I, I did we get a biomass sample, or did we just get the the yield off of it, not a breakdown on a nutrient breakdown? Yeah, we did get that. We they did, did get that? that. They did have that, but I don't. Okay. Can't rattle off the top of my head. Cody, when you when you guys when you guys graze corn, how do you like you talk to the a lot of people that do it? And they talk ten pounds of corn a day, and then they you fence that off and they eat the forage. Yep. I mean, you figure that out, you pencil that out, what it'll cost you right there. That's a pretty economical way to, to run cows. Absolutely. Especially this year when you have wet corn. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. I, I know where there's still some fields standing, and um, it's really 
if I didn't still have cows grazing cover crops, I'd be over there trying to get their corn grazed for them. But um, I do think, I do think, I think year in, year out. And the other thing, like I, like I mentioned before, it gives you an opportunity to get a spring crop first or let your spring growing cover crop uh, just grow bigger. You know, you can produce more carbon. You can do, get more soil health benefits out of that before coming back into, into doing something like this because like you said, you're not worried about drying it down. As a matter of fact, I got some friends in Canada that talk about that. They don't even want their corn to hit black layer if they're gonna graze it. There, there was a lot of hands went up of people who are gonna try it. One thing I would encourage you to do though is have a plan as far as how you're gonna get the cover crop planted because getting the cover crop planted early to get it ahead of the weeds I think is gonna be crucial. Our, my first two goals in this was try to maintain yield and keep the field clean. Because if you go out there and you think about where you're putting it too, don't put it on your dirty field. Try to pick a clean spot because if you go out there and you plant it and you spray it before the corn comes up and then you aren't ready to plant your cover crop, if those weeds are getting a start on you, you're gonna be in trouble, I think. We're, we're way okay. over, so. We're way over. Yeah, the questions are great. I don't wanna stop progress, but we have what we call our meet and greet. So this is opportunity for us to continue the conversation. And we'll, we'll do that with Cody and David and everyone in the room. So we can pass the mic around. I was just getting some of them to work again. I don't know. So thank you, Cody and David. Um, I really appreciate it.